speakers from Armenia came to the European Parliament and they will be with us in the afternoon. Um, let me tell you very, very briefly that Armenia is a country of great historical fate of um, the country, the discussion of whose politics and culture is of critical importance for the region, for Europe. Suffice it to mention that Armenia is an inescapable part of European legacy and European culture. It's an ancient and sophisticated culture. It's uh, one of the first Christian countries in the world. It's a country which made uh, a great footprint on the thought of Persian, European, uh, North American intellectual and artistic cultures. I think anybody knows that the great Charles Aznavour is of Armenian background, and the same applies to the talented Canadian film director Atom Egoyan. So Armenia's legacy and Armenia's contribution to the world is so immense that it's very difficult to cover it in a couple of sentences. When it comes to Armenia at the beginning of the 21st century, we know that any discussion touches upon some critically important points. Turkey, Russia, the geopolitical situation of Caucasus, some probably key aspects of the future regarding uh, the region, safety, security issues, everything is here. Uh, let me explain why we chose the title on the boundary of two worlds. Actually, since I myself am Lit Lithuanian and since I just wanted to drop a hint to the Lithuanian-Armenian liaison, the title is related to Lithuanian intellectual and political history. That was the title of the, of the book uh, which a Lithuanian philosopher, Shalkowskis, wrote in Switzerland, Sur la Confante du Monde, on the boundary of two worlds, and that was in Switzerland. That it, for the first time, the book appeared on Lithuania as balancing between the East and the West, according to Shalkowskis. So I think it perfectly applies to many countries that somehow have the many traces, cultural, intellectual, political ones, many traces in Europe or some other civilizations. And that's why we will try, we'll try to touch upon some aspects of geopolitical situation, human rights in civil society, and of course, Turkish-Armenian relations, which are very hot and important things concerning um, the political life of our moment. Uh, let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Stepan Grigorian, Chairman of the Board of the Analytical Center on Globalization and Regional Cooperation from Yerevan, Armenia. His title is Russia and Azerbaijan Relations as Regards to Conflict on Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Dr. Stepan Grigorian, the floor is yours. Уважаемые дамы и господа, уважаемые депутаты Европарламента, хочу выразить благодарность Альянсу демократических и либеральных сил, а также депутату Леониду Судоскису, выступивших с инициативой проведения данной конференции. Также хотел бы поблагодарить посла Литвы в Армении, господина Гедриса Апокаса, за содействие данной инициативе. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable members of the European Parliament, I am grateful to the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe and to MEP Leonidas Donskis for initiating this conference, as well as to Lithuania's ambassador in Armenia, Gedros Apuakas, for supporting this initiative. The history of the Armenian people and the tragic events of 1915, when the Ottoman Empire was destroyed by half a million Armenians, and still one million was destroyed by the world, by the Armenian people to the diaspora nation, наложили серьезный отпечаток на армянскую общественную мысль и элиту, а также серьезно воздействует на внешнюю политику уже сегодняшней независимой Армении. The Armenian elite's way of thinking and Armenia's foreign policy have been influenced by the history of the Armenian people, particularly the tragic events of 1915, where nearly 1.5 million Armenians were exterminated in the Ottoman Empire, and a million people were spread all over the world, forming the diaspora. Все это особенно хорошо видно на примере армяно-турецких отношений. Так, инициативы президента Армении Сержа Саркисиана по нормализации армяно-турецких отношений в армянских диаспорах большинства стран мира были восприняты достаточно сдержанно, 
а в отдельных странах диаспора была откровенно против нормализации отношений без признания Турции геноцида армян 1915 года. The diaspora was totally opposed to normalization unless Turkey recognized the genocide of 1915. Внутри Армении эти проблемы проявляются в том, что даже многие партии демократического и либерального толка, борющиеся за права человека, за недопущение фальсификации на армянских выборах, за демократизацию Армении, однако в отношении Турции и Карабахского вопроса имеют жесткую и непримиримую позицию. Это касается в том числе и парламентской оппозиции, а также части вне парламентской оппозиции Армении. There are problems in Armenia as well. Even though many democratic liberal parties that demand the democratization in Armenia resist election fraud and protect human rights, also have an uncompromising stance towards Turkey and the resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. This is true for the parliamentary opposition and for a large part of the non-parliamentary opposition. В своем докладе я коснусь двух вопросов, которые имеют как региональное, так и международное звучание. Кроме того, эти вопросы хорошо отражают роли места глобальных игроков, имеющих интересы в регионе Южного Кавказа. Они также напрямую затрагивают проблемы российско-азербайджанских отношений. And to the issue of the Russo-Azerbaijani relations. Первый вопрос касается армяно-турецких отношений. Мы приветствовали инициативы президента Армении по нормализации армяно-турецких отношений без предварительных условий. Думаем, что подписанные 10 октября 2010 года два армяно-турецких протокола содержат в себе важные взаимные компромиссы. Согласно текстам протоколов, Армения фактически признает сегодняшнюю армяно-турецкую границу и не требует от Турции немедленного признания геноцида армян, а Турция, в свою очередь, согласилась не упоминать проблему Нагорного Карабаха. По крайней мере, согласно текстам протоколов, это именно так. We consider that the protocol signed on the 10th of October 2009 supposed an important mutual compromise. By the protocols, Armenia would have recognized the border between the two states and would not demand an immediate recognition of the genocide by Turkey. Turkey, in turn, would not mention the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. And this could be derived from the text of the protocols. Однако прошедшее время показало, после подписания протоколов показало, что пока еще окончательно не устранены факторы, мешающие нормализации армяно-турецких отношений, поэтому и протоколы пока еще не ратифицированы ни турецким, ни армянским парламентами. Здесь особенно серьезные проблемы возникли у Турции. Это и жесткое давление Азербайджана на Турцию, руководство которого открытие армяно-турецкой границы рассматривает в качестве угрозы своей безопасности, так и проблемы с, ну, с внутриполитическим напряжением, где оппозиционные силы в турецком парламенте также выступают против открытия границы. Оказалось, что Турция не готова к нормализации отношений с Арменией без предварительных условий и пока еще увязывает решение этих проблем с карабахским вопросом. However, since the signing of the protocols, it has become clear that the factors impeding the normalization of Armenian Turkish relations were not counterbalanced. So neither Turkish nor Armenian parliaments have ratified the protocols. Turkey experienced serious problems in this respect. There was strong pressure by Azerbaijan, as Azerbaijan's leadership considered the opening of the border between Turkey and Armenia a security threat. There was also internal tension within Turkey, where the parliamentary opposition was against opening of the border. It turned out that Turkey had not been ready to normalize the relations with Armenia without preconditions, And connects that with the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. Что же делать в создавшейся ситуации? Думаем, сегодня самым разумным для сторон будет взятие небольшой паузы и отказ от резких и обижающих друг друга заявлений. Дело в том, что у нас нет сомнений, что процесс армяно-турецкого сближения имеет объективные основы. 
так как это исходит из интересов как Турции, так и Арбении. Поэтому он с неизбежностью продолжится уже в ближайшее время. What may be done in the present situation? I suggest that the best way would be to take a short break, during which both sides should abstain from making statements against each other. The Armenian-Turkish rapprochement has an objective basis and matches the interests of both countries, so it may certainly be resumed soon. Особенно остановлюсь на позиции Азербайджана по этому вопросу. Обеспокоенный таким бурным развитием событий, Азербайджан начал как политическое, так и экономическое давление на Турцию. Так, Баку отказался продавать газ Анкары по льготным ценам. Более того, впервые за многие годы Баку согласился продавать свой газ России, давать, давая понять Анкаре, что у него есть альтернатива в регионе. Worried by the Armenian-Turkish rapprochement, Azerbaijan began applying political and economic pressure on Turkey. For instance, Azerbaijan refused to sell natural gas to Turkey at a discounted price. Moreover, for the first time in many years, Azerbaijan agreed to sell gas to Russia, letting Turkey know that Azerbaijan may have an alternative solution. Такие действия Азербайджана до определенной степени оказались неожиданными и, как представляется, носят ситуационный характер. Действительно, отношения между Баку и Москвой сложились достаточно сложными, и причин тому много. Это и строительство Азербайджана нефти и газопроводов, обходящих Россию, это и членство в организации ГУАМ, которую Россия считает противовесом СНГ на постсоветском пространстве. Это и то, что Азербайджан не согласился на сохранение военного присутствия России на его территории, а также и приграничные проблемы, где Москва неоднократно обвиняла Баку в поддержке фундаменталистских группировок на Северном Кавказе. Membership in the Guam, which is considered by Russia as an antagonist of the CIS, Azerbaijan's refusal to let Russian military presence on its territory, and the border issues. Russia many times has blamed Azerbaijan for alleged support to the fundamentalist fractions in the North Caucasus. Однако главная проблема, вносящая серьезный разлад в российско-азербайджанские отношения, это проблема нерешенности Карабахского конфликта, в чем Баку постоянно упрекает в Москву так как там существует заблуждение, что якобы ключ решения карабахской проблемы находится в Кремле. The main problem in Russo-Azerbaijan relations, however, is the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. Baku has been blaming Moscow consistently because of the erroneous belief that the Kremlin has the ultimate key for the conflict resolution. Интересна роль мировых игроков в армян-турецком вопросе. Известно, что США и Европейский Союз приложили немало сил для нормализации армяно-турецких отношений, так как оба заинтересованы в стабильности и мире на Южном Кавказе, в бесперебойной работе всех энергетических проектов, идущих по линии Восток-Запад. Однако новым является то, что и Россия сегодня не против, по крайней мере пока, открытия армяно-турецкой границы. Причин здесь много, начиная от экономических и энергетических интересов, Известно, что российские монополисты, которые занимают сильные позиции в экономике Армении, смогут через армян-турецкую границу, открытую границу, выйти на турецкие рынки. Кончая тем, что после августовской войны 2008 года российско-грузинские отношения испортились надолго, а потому Россия хотела бы ослабить транзитную зависимость Армении от Грузии. The role of global players in Armenian Turkish relations is interesting. The United States and the European Union have been trying hard to help to normalize relations, since they are interested in peace and stability in the South Caucasus and in the stable functioning of the energy grids. The new element is that Russia has not recently been against the opening of the border between Turkey and Armenia. There are several reasons for this. Beginning with economic interest, as Russian monopolies having strong position in Armenian economy might be able to enter the Turkish markets ending with Russia's attempt to decrease Armenia's dependence on transit via Georgia, as, especially after the war in 2008, Russo-Georgian relations will remain hostile for a long time. Второй вопрос касается Карабахской проблемы. Сегодня сложилась ситуация, когда достаточно интенсифицировался переговорный процесс, и это надо только приветствовать. Так, за 2009 год президенты Армении и Азербайджана встречались шесть раз. В рамках Минской группы ОБСЕ – 
главного формата решения Карабахского конфликта ведется интенсивная работа, а на столе переговоров лежит вариант решения, который называют мадридскими принципами. Ключевыми здесь являются три основных принципа – территориальная целостность государств, право народов на самоопределение и мирное решение конфликта. Казалось бы, что все предпосылки для подписания мирного договора есть, однако стороны не делают этого. Почему? The second issue concerns Nagorno-Karabakh. In the recent period, the negotiations have been rather intensive, and that is very welcomed. In 2009, presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan met six times. Within the OSCE Minsk group, intensive work has been going on, with the Madrid principles on the negotiation table. Here, there are three fundamental principles. Territorial integrity, the right to self-determination, and peaceful conflict resolution. It seems that there are, these are all preconditions for a settlement agreement, but the sides do not agree. Why does it happen? Думаем, что главной причиной нерешенности конфликта является отсутствие доверия между сторонами конфликта. К сожалению, это доверие отсутствует не только на официальном, но и на гражданском уровне. Пропаганда вражды стала составной частью многих политических акций, проходящих в наших странах. Конечно, здесь особенно выделяется Азербайджан где постоянно на самом высоком уровне делаются воинственные и угрожающие заявления в адрес Армении и Нагорного Карабаха. No mutual trust between the conflicting sides may be the main reason for the absence of an agreement. Unfortunately, there is a lack of confidence not only between the state officials, but also between the societies. The propaganda of hostility has been the important component of political actions in our countries. This is especially true for Azerbaijan, where the highest state officials have been repeating hostile statements and threats against Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. Понятно, что в таких напряженных и недоверительных условиях невозможно реализовать даже самый лучший, содержащий в себе компромисс и вариант решения конфликта. Очевидно, что вопросы повышения уровня доверия, воспитания у наших граждан толерантности и понятия компромисса необходимо внести в повестку переговоров в рамках Минской группы ОБСЕ и поставить на один уровень с основными мадридскими принципами, а не оставлять эти вопросы лишь гражданскому сектору Армении и Азербайджан. Всем известно, что основные средства массовой информации, первым долгом телеканала Азербайджана и Армении, находятся под значительным контролем властей. Поэтому они и должны эти возможности использовать для повышения мер доверия в армяно-азербайджанских отношениях. Certainly, when such tension and hostility is in place, it is not possible to implement even the best compromise resolution model. It is clear that such issues as confidence building and promotion of tolerance and readiness to compromise among the citizens should be included in the agenda of negotiations in the framework of the OSCE Minsk group, next to the main Madrid principles. These issues should not be left only to the civil societies in Armenia and Azerbaijan. It is a known fact that the leading media, and first of all the television, are controlled by the authorities in both Armenia and Azerbaijan. So those media should be used to promote confidence building. Посмотрим, какова позиция мировых игроков в Карабахском вопросе. Сегодня наблюдается консенсус у США и России, как в необходимости нормализации армяно-турецких отношений, так и по ситуации в Карабахском конфликте. Кроме того, обе державы считают необходимым разъединение процесса нормализации армяно-турецких отношений от решения Карабахского конфликта. Против этого выступает Азербайджан, считая, что нормализация армяно-турецких отношений может произойти лишь после решения Карабахского вопроса. Отметим, что Европейский Союз также считает, что эти два процесса не взаимосвязаны. Let me now consider the position of global players on the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. Presently, the US and Russia have a consensus on the need to normalize Armenian and Turkish relations and on the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. Importantly, both US and Russia consider that the Armenian-Turkish relations and the Nagorno-Karabakh issue should be separated from each other. Notably, the European Union also considers that two processes are not in interconnected. Az Azerbaijan remains a vocal opponent of such approach, demanding that normalization of Armenian-Turkish relations should occur only after a resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. Как представляется, сегодня США и Россия считают невозможным быстрое решение Карабахского конфликта. Только мотивации у России и США разные. Так сегодня очевидно, что Россия, не зная о том, что будет в регионе в постконфликтной ситуации, 
Например, миротворческие воинские контингенты каких стран будут расквартированы в зоне конфликта, не заинтересованы в скором решении карабахской проблемы. США в большей степени заинтересованы в быстром решении конфликта. Однако они не имеют эффективных рычагов влияния на ситуацию, а кроме того, хорошо понимают, что искусственное ускорение решения карабахской проблемы чревато возобновлением боевых действий. It seems that both the U.S. and Russia now consider it impossible to solve the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict fast, but they have different motivations. Russia, being not sure about likely post-conflict developments, for instance, which countries will form the peacekeeping force, does not want the conflict to be solved quickly. The U.S. would prefer a quick solution, but it has uh, no effective leverage for that. And there is also an understanding that an artificial stimulation of conflict resolution may result in resumed fighting. Продолжая тему российско-азербайджанских отношений, отметим, что дополнительную напряженность в эти отношения вносит и то, что Баку настороженно смотрит на желание России разместить своих миротворцев в зоне Карабахского конфликта. Проявлением этой напряженности можно считать решение Министерства иностранных дел Азербайджана запретить въезд на свою территорию большого числа граждан России, в том числе и пяти депутатов Госдумы России, за их участие в наблюдении парламентских выборов, состоящихся 23 мая 2010 года в Нагорном Карабахе. Как видим, не помогло россиянам и то, что двумя днями ранее МИД России выступил с заявлением, где не признал результаты выборов, прошедших в Нагорном Карабахе. With consideration of the Russo-Azerbaijani relations, it may also be noted that these relations are also troubled because Azerbaijan is suspicious about Russia's wish to deploy its peacekeepers in the conflict zone. An additional sign of the tension was the decision of Azerbaijan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to declare persona non grata a number of Russian citizens, including five members of the Duma, who participated in the monitoring mission during the parliamentary elections in Nagorno-Karabakh on the 23rd of May 2010. Azerbaijan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs made these decisions despite Russia's declaration about not recognizing the elections in Nagorno-Karabakh. Очень важно и положительно, что Европарламент начал проявлять большую заинтересованность в решении проблем Южного Кавказа, в том числе Карабахского конфликта, что видно из резолюции, принятой 20 мая всего года на пленарном заседании Европарламента. Единственное, на что мы хотели бы обратить внимание ваше, так это то, что в резолюции нашли место формулировки типа «вывод армянских войск с оккупированных территорий Азербайджана» или «отказаться от установленного силой и не соответствующего международным законам статуса КВО». I would, however, invite your attention to some parts of the resolution, to such expressions as withdrawal of Armenian forces from all occupied territories of Azerbaijan, or the status quo created by force and with no international legitimacy. Это показывает, что авторы текста резолюции не знали о том, что Карабахскую войну начал Азербайджан. К чести руководства Азербайджана, надо сказать, оно никогда не опровергало того факта, что они начали войну против армян Нагорного Карабаха. Поэтому авторы резолюции безосновательно взваливают ответственность за сегодняшний статус-кво в, в зоне Карабахского конфликта только на армянскую сторону. Usage of such expressions shows that the authors of the resolution did not know that the war in Karabakh has been launched by Azerbaijan. I would even praise the leaders of Azerbaijan as they have never denied the fact that Azerbaijan started fighting against the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. So, the resolution's author's inclination to blame only the Armenian side for the present status quo in the conflict zone is misguided. Кроме того, в резолюции Европарламента говорится о том, что Нагорному Карабаху может быть дан определенный промежуточный статус до уточнения окончательного статуса. Прекрасно. Тогда скажите, что это за промежуточный статус, чтобы мы могли активно агитировать в Армении и Нагорном Карабахе за такой вариант решения проблемы. Но вот, что мы в Армении и Нагорном Карабахе в любом случае должны и обязаны сделать. Так это быть готовыми к компромиссам и уступкам в решении конфликта. Конечно, было бы хорошо, если бы эта готовность была и у противостоящей стороны, у Азербайджана. Besides, the European Parliament's resolution mentions that an interim status for Nagorno-Karabakh could offer a solution until the final status is de determined. Fine, but then let us know what kind of an interim status this is, 
so that we would be able to propose such a solution in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. What we certainly must do in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh is to be ready for a compromise solution. It would also be good if Azerbaijan also showed readiness to compromise. И в заключение хотела бы сказать о следующем. Разные государства и организации работают в регионе Южного Кавказа разными инструментами. Так август 2008 года показал, что на Южном Кавказе некоторые державы действуют силовыми методами. Как нам кажется, в отличие от них, для повышения влияния на Южном Кавказе, Европейскому Союзу необходимо акцентировать свое внимание на работе с независимыми институтами гражданского общества региона и, что самое главное, в сотрудничестве с властями стран Южного Кавказа настаивать на проведении демократических реформ, уважении к правам человека, проведении справедливых выборов, выполнении принципа верховенства закона, а также эффективной борьбы с коррупцией. Спасибо за внимание. In conclusion, I would like to mention the following. Different states and organizations use different leverages in the South Caucasus. August 2008 showed that some are ready to use military force. I suggest that unlike this, the EU may increase its influence in the South Caucasus by means of cooperation with independent civil society institutions, and most importantly, by demanding from the authorities of the South Caucasian countries to implement democratic reforms, to respect human rights, to conduct free elections, to respect the rule of law, and to fight corruption effectively. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Grigorian, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to suggest that we um, have all of our papers scheduled for, uh, for this session and then the debate afterwards. So that would allow us to save some time because some of our colleagues are in rush. So and that's why I would like to give the floor to uh, colleague Mr. Tevan Pogosian, Executive Director of the International Center for Human Development, and the title of his paper is The Eastern Partnership. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Danskich. Uh, I would also like to express my thanks to all organizers for this event, uh, and uh, with the hope that there will be more and more events on Armenia in the European Parliament. Uh, specifically with the all initiatives and also to the all speakers. Uh, unfortunately, I need to be out from the room at 4.30. That's why the, I will be having time to give my presentation as much as possible. If there will be any question, I would appreciate to take one or two before 4.30 and then I will leave and my colleagues will continue. Uh, now, let's start about uh, Eastern Partnership. Actually, uh, coming out from your title on like an on the boundaries of two words, I think it was a situation when uh, all South Caucasus, or all former uh, Soviet Union countries find themselves after collapse of Soviet Union, where to go, how to go, how the legal system of the countries uh, uh, based. And like till the 2000, I think uh, there was always some objective way to be on the two sides and some subjective logic. But starting from 2000s, more and more countries start to uh, really take their direction towards one of the sides. Uh, it wasn't just simply bouncing between East and West, but there was a con concrete direction. Like uh, the case with Armenia was that after 2000, uh, Armenia was the much more entering with the PCA agreement and uh, later on with the AMP, and uh, now with Eastern Partnership, uh, definitely took the European way of development from the uh, kind of internal uh, logic of the country. And the whole legal base is now uh, under the Europeanization issue. Uh, specifically with the Eastern Partnership, there uh, will be approximation. More and more going on, as you know, uh, there's a two years already for uh, Polish-Swedish proposal, and there's a one year as Eastern Partnership is in force. Uh, it's very difficult to say that there's any progress, but at least there is a good idea that uh, from the mid of July, association agreement negotiations will be started, which means that it's already one serious step would be uh, to take the country towards the European uh, integration. Uh, definitely uh, deep and uh, comprehensive uh, free trade agreement will start its activity. Uh, then the visa facilitation in the progress of the whole negotiation. Armenia is in rush with signing with all European countries uh, all necessary treaties, specifically on the readmission issues 
uh, to be able to really be ready for the visa facilitation issue. I think uh, with the, all these uh, initiatives, uh, one of the best issues that Armenia uh, uh, took the serious real uh, Eastern Partnership reform. But now, uh, with all that processes, let me bring some uh, issues which are not just so positive, just simply on this way. Uh, in 2005, European neighborhood policy started, and everyone was hoping that there'll be a real great movement of the reforms passing in the country and moving ahead toward the party. Uh, then uh, the process was been slowed down with the election circle, but in any way, uh, something has been going on, very slow, very, very far. And after that, the issues of the Eastern Partnership started to be discussed, and there was a great hope that, you know, like if EMP is the more bilateral uh, project, then Eastern Partnership is more like a regionalization issue, is when the regional component would be very strongly presented. Uh, unfortunately, I, they haven't uh, heard or listened uh, ever about how the Eastern Partnership really, uh, the program will be a uh, typical uh, issue of regionalization. Uh, w w what it's giving to part, because it's still on the bilateral issue that Eastern Partnership programs are being presented. Uh, specifically, we can say that uh, there's a too little in the program as a context for such countries as Ukraine and uh, maybe Georgia uh, from the legal reform side because they are uh, much more on the advanced level of the uh, kind of a fighting corruption, uh, election issues and many other elements, specifically uh, Ukraine, which is was able to overcome the full one circle of EMP and there was a well, already the negotiation about uh, enhancement uh, cooperation agreement, and then kind of a, they received just simply Eastern Partnership issues, and they always consider them for something lower. And that's why there is no kind of a dynamic of the region which is going on in the Eastern Partnership, which I think uh, maybe would be very interesting. It's, for example, the same European Parliament can now uh, strongly push for such component be filled with the, after Lisbon Treaty with the uh, European Union, uh, kind of a more centralized structures. Because one of the issues that has been always uh, teased said that uh, there's no one number in Europe to whom call. And uh, with the Eastern Partnership and now after Lisbon Treaty, I think uh, still we are in a situation when there's no one phone number to which you can call and discuss the issues. And, I think you, you need to really uh, move on that uh, direction kind of strongly. But there are also uh, one more addition in the Eastern Partnership, which is very positively accepted, I think, by all countries. It's civil society dimension. Uh, with the European neighborhood policy issue was like purely on the state uh, relationship and EU. The all reforms has been dependent on the direct negotiation between state institutions and uh, European Union structures. Now, with the Eastern Partnership, that institution of civil society that has been invented uh, was kind of a welcomed back by the whole public, because if the public is not engaged in the process of reforms, uh, no reforms will take place in reality. Uh, there was uh, last year already the first event of civil society uh, forum uh, in Brussels, in this city. Uh, for this year, it's scheduled again in November uh, in Berlin, which will go. And I would like to hear mention uh, about the progress in Armenia, and I would uh, like to uh, kind of appraise also Mr. Navasadan, who's sitting here, because under his leadership, uh, just uh, two days ago, Armenia was able to be the first country who established national platform on Eastern uh, Partnership Civil Society uh, in, in uh, Armenia, uh, with engagement of about 146 or 45 uh, non-governmental or civil society institutions uh, back there. Uh, it's just the beginning, and we'll see how uh, with the, all these four directions, four pro platforms, which are devoted one to the good governance, democracy, rule of law issues, and another one for economic progress and economic reforms uh, with the energy security and environmental issues and people-to-people -people contacts, uh, will be able to push for the real local initiatives on developing 
cooperation with the state institutions back in Armenia and how this would be appreciated by the European structures here. Everything is still in progress. It's very uh, early to talk about uh, successes, but it seems that with Eastern Partnership, we got at least chance or opportunity. And with this opportunity, is, it would be really able to use and maybe your support kind of it could be also helpful to see that our European example of cooperation would uh, be helpful. Maybe we can move ahead and uh, reach to the part. If not, then I would say that uh, Eastern Partnership was just a simple uh, reaction to the Southern Partnership and uh, will not be really able to prove that there is some real progress on that regard. I think with that, I would like to stop uh, here, and if there would be any question, I'll be ready to answer. If not, then uh, I will leave you at first certain end. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, and yes, if I can disrupt so the logic of our conversation, so to say, if you can take one or two questions just before you're just about to leave, if there are some hot questions or comments, please go ahead. Because if you are not ready yet, so then... Uh, I'm too successful. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. And uh, now uh, I would like to ask to present a paper. I think it's a joint. It's a joint paper. Yep. So by Mr. Yep. No? My paper. Yeah. Okay. So just two speakers had indicated, and I, by my naivete, I thought that... <laughs> Absolutely, two papers, yeah. So we have two papers on um, policies um, on policies regarding uh, Armenian-Turkish relations, yes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just um, a second, I'm going to say that oh, oh, sorry. what is misleading a little bit is that, you know, there is one title and two speakers here. Could be, and that's why I decided, I'm very, very sorry, so this is my problem. Uh, in fact, we have two papers on Armenian-Turkish relations, and I would like... Uh, to give the floor to two towering specialists uh, on this issue, uh, Mr. Alexander Iskandiran is first, and he's director of Caucasus Institute in Yerevan. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to join my colleagues and express my thanks to organizers uh, of this uh, event uh, and go forward to, to, to the topic. Uh, just just uh, two years ago, efforts to normalize Armenian-Turkey relations were made public following a round of secret talks between Armenians and Turks with Swiss uh, mediation. This project gained uh, international renown at the, at the Armenian-Turkish or Armenian-Turkey rapprochement. For a while, it put Armenia and Turkey in the spotlight of world news and international politics. Throughout this relatively short time span, hopes for rapid settlement of all issues and despair about failures followed an up and down curve. By now, the rapprochement process has been suspended, uh, seemingly until after the uh, 2011 parliamentary uh, elections in Turkey at the least. Uh, Turkey's ruling AKP party has been under the uh, fire from the opposition on several counts, including its policy of rapprochement with Armenia. It uh, appears that the AKP leadership has decided against going ahead with the rapprochement to the detriment of the party's prospects in next uh, year's elections. The main obstacle to the rapprochement has so far been the move to tie it to the management of the conflict uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh, which amounts to going back to square one, i.e. to Turkey's position prior to the start of uh, negotiations or, or open, uh, open part of, uh, of rapprochement, let's say. Progress uh, in the settlement of the uh, conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh is certainly badly needed. However, making one complicated problem dependent on another two often means preventing the resolution of either of the two. The situation in Armenia is generally less complex uh, than in Turkey. Uh, although an important segment of the society is opposed to the current format of rapprochement with Turkey, uh, I mean intellectuals, journalists, 
uh, some uh, apolitical party, etc. Uh, but the ruling elites are consolidated around unconditional normalization, or as they phrase it, normalizing diplomatic ties and opening uh, borders, borders without precondition of any kind. It's an official position of uh, Armenia. The problem is that while Armenia is ready to open borders unconditionally, opposition actors in Turkey uh, assume this government, uh, the government of def defeatism, should it also go for unconditional normalization. This looks like a deadlock, but in fact it is much less of a deadlock uh, than the original status quo prior to the first round of rapprochement in 2008. Clearly, the two countries launched uh, the rapprochement project without being fully aware of the potential challenges. During the negotiations, many new problems arose in both domestic and foreign policies of the two countries. Yet, uh, though the rapprochement has been suspended, it is not dead. This is a lock, but not a deadlock. Too many things have changed in Armenia-Turkey relations over the last two years and some of these changes are in, I, irreversible. The Turkish president paid a visit to Armenia on the invitation of the Armenian counterpart. The Armenian president returned the visit later. Two protocols signed by two countries, foreign ministers, were made public in autumn 2009. Neither, nine, neither of the two contains any mention of Nagorno-Karabakh or Azerbaijan. The protocols still exist, and the signatures of the two ministers have not been revoked, despite various oral statements be made by uh, two countries' public officials. Cooperation between civil societies has grown manifold. Now it involves academics, artists, human rights activists, musicians, uh, journalists, movie makers, and so on. The so-called Armenian question or in Turkey or the Turkey question in Armenia uh, have become parts of the respective domestic discourses. Various joint Armenian-Turkish initiatives in a wide variety of spheres are springing up every day. The physical borders remain shut, but the mental borders are going down and have continued going down even after the suspension uh, of the diplomatic uh, uh, efforts and normalization. This is a key development that affects the societies themselves and enable, uh, many th enables many things uh, that very unthinkable just a few years ago. External support to the project is almost universal. Each acting for their own reasons and using their own set of tools the United States, the European Union, and Russia have acted as proponents and in many ways also sponsors of the normalization effort. In fact, it has had no external opponents so far apart from Azerbaijan, whose position is quite understandable, and Dr. Kirkuran uh, said about it. Inside Turkish society, the trend of favor of normalization with Armenia is still strong although the opposite, opposite trend is also gaining momentum. The rapprochement is in standby mode, but not fully stopped, there is still hope. The hope lies in the two countries' good will and common sense. For Armenia, the opening of its borders to Turkey has very high priority. Turkey lies between Armenia and Europe. Many of Armenia's problems are the result of its geographical isolation from Europe. As to Turkey, for a while it has uh, had zero problems with neighbors as its foreign policy doctrine. It cannot fulfill its aspiration to become a key player in the South Caucasus unless it settled uh, its problems uh, with uh, Armenia. So far, the will of the regional players is sufficient to keep the rapprochement alive and kick it back into action in some point. Should the project really fail, the entire region will end up even worse 
than it uh, had been prior to the launch of Rapprochement. A failed regional normalization project will certainly throw the whole region back in many ways. Judging from history, borders do not stay sealed forever. They open at some point, that's why they are called borders, not walls. However, timing matters for Armenia and for the rest of the regions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And now I have a pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Richard Giragosian, director of the Armenian Center for National and International Studies. Let me first thank everyone for coming today and to the organizers, of course. Let me also explain. The issue of Turkish-Armenian diplomacy and relations is so complex that it takes or requires two Armenians to present papers on the same topic. Uh, but actually, let me try to present a similar analysis. Unfortunately for the audience, Dr. Iskandarian and I basically agree on almost every issue. So I'm going to try to present an alternative uh, approach. First, the panel's title, our panel specifically, is Pragmatic Policies versus Historical Limitations. In this context, uh, Armenian-Turkish diplomacy is both. It is both pragmatic, but also defined by historical limitations. But I would like to present an analysis uh, of only five points, the first four of which are actually questions. Uh, first, where are we specifically? How did we get here? What is different this time than ever before? And what is next in terms of Armenian-Turkish diplomacy? Uh, first of all, where are we? As my colleague has noted, uh, we are in a temporary suspension, a temporary suspension of the diplomatic effort where the protocols that were signed between Armenia and Turkey, I like this cafe, it's both a lecture hall and a cafe. Uh, and I'll take coffee, guys. Uh, um, no coffee, please. Merci. We'll be interrupted later when they bring the bill, but let me go on. <laughs> so in terms of where are we, we are in a temporary timeout, if you will, that is actually convenient for both sides, mainly because there is a fundamental division between the Armenian and Turkish views of the issue. There's a difference in both time and context. From the Armenian point of view, Armenian patience is not without limit. It's not infinite. We cannot wait forever for Turkey to make up its mind what it wants. At the same time, there's a difference in context. The protocols were a result of difficult negotiations. Turkey agreed to remove the precondition of Nagorno-Karabakh. In fact, within the protocols that were signed, there is no mention whatsoever of Nagorno-Karabakh making a late stage demand or attempt to restore a link between the two issues is very disingenuous and counterproductive. But what's most important of where we are, the fate of the Turkish-Armenian protocols is very much dependent now on domestic Turkish politics. And this is a problem because no one can influence domestic Turkish politics, not the Americans, not the Europeans, not even the Armenians. In many ways, objectively, Armenia has done everything it can and should regarding its effort with Turkey. The real burden is on Turkey today. But in terms of where we are, what is most significant was the first casualty of Armenian-Turkish diplomacy the first loser or casualty was actually Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, in many ways, is justified in feeling betrayed and disrespected by Turkey. In many ways, Turkey made a strategic mistake from the very beginning. Turkey was mistaken in underestimating Azerbaijan's reaction and arrogantly overestimating Turkey's ability to pressure or bully Azerbaijan. Secondly, in terms of how did we get here, I think what's most illustrating is the fact that 
Armenia and Turkey arrived in Zurich and signed historic protocols after several years of secret diplomacy that required mediation and hand holding, holding by the Swiss. This only demonstrates how hard and how complex the problem is, that it couldn't be done by Armenia and Turkey on their own, but it required a third party mediator. The other important factor of how did we get here, and to say something unpopular for the Armenian side, in many ways, the Armenian government was desperate for a foreign policy success because of a lack of legitimacy. And it chose Armenia-Turkey as its gamble for greater legitimacy and risking a foreign policy success. But it was a move out of weakness, not strength, and not of desperation. The second important factor is that for Turkish policy, this was a profound change. For years, Turkish policy regarding Armenia was based on one word, no. It was based on a rejection of the Armenian genocide and nothing more. Turkish policy realized a little late, but realized that Turkish foreign policy options were far too limited in the region. What Turkey could do with Armenia and the broader region had become hostage to Azerbaijan and was far too limited for Turkey's own good. So in many ways, Turkey's outreach and an effort to engage Armenia is part of a bigger effort in terms of assuming a greater role in the region beyond Azerbaijan and beyond the confines of the past. In other words, Turkish policy is a recognition that its policy failed. The blockade of Armenia, etc., denial of diplomatic relations was a failed policy. It didn't work. In fact, in many ways, when Turkey challenges Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan has no alternative. And sealed and closed borders and denying diplomatic relations is not normal. It's not a policy. It's it's the exception. It's the aberration. It's unacceptable. Thirdly, if we look at what is different now in Armenian-Turkish diplomacy than past efforts, there are three interesting examples or factors. The first thing, again, is about Turkish strategy. In my opinion, understanding Turkey's perspective on Armenia, it's also about Brazil and Gaza. It's about Turkish strategy in partnering with Brazil in offering an alternative, not necessarily pro-Western, plan to deal with Iran. It's also about Gaza in terms of Turkey playing not just a greater regional role, but trying to become a global actor. In other words, Turkey's outreach and strategy with Armenia, the region, is part of a more ambitious global effort to become more of a player. And in many ways, this is a challenge, but it's also important because it's about Turkey reasserting itself. But the interesting thing is the future trajectory or direction of Turkey is far from clear. The battle is within Turkey, redefining what it means to be a Turk in terms of Turkish identity and redefining Turkey's strategic future. This is not and no longer an effort to please the Americans or to appease the Europeans. This is a Turkish diplomatic offensive based on Turkish national interests. From an Armenian perspective, however, this means that this is why it may work this time. In other words, it's much more a Turkish effort based on their own needs and desires. The second interesting factor on why this time it may work, unlike previous attempts, is Russia's role. Russia is actually, for the first time in a very long time, being very cooperative and supportive of the overall process, mainly because it's Russia that stands to benefit in the short term by further isolating Georgia, by also exploiting its, its control over key sectors of the Armenian economy. And in the short term, the Turkish engagement in the region is based on a recognition of Russian power and influence after the Georgian war. 
The third factor on what makes this different is actually the August war in Georgia. In many ways, it was the war in Georgia that had remade or reconfigured the regional map. In many ways, Armenian-Turkish diplomacy has the potential to again remake the map geopolitically of the region, this time in a more positive way. Uh, the fourth question in terms of what's next, especially now that the process has been temporarily suspended. I would argue that there are two specific areas going on today between Armenia and Turkey. One involves civil society and it's people on both sides of the border, of the closed border, mind you, who are engaged in sustaining the momentum between the two sides, not dependent on politics or state-to-state -state negotiations, but people like Boris Navasartyan, Alexander Iskandarian, that are working with partners on the Turkish side to sustain momentum and engagement, both within civil society, within media, and within key academic and intellectual circles. From an Armenian perspective, this is also crucial because Turkey is moving slowly and too slowly toward genocide recognition. Whether it really admits it or not, this is where Turkey is moving. The Armenian side is trying to encourage this. And that's why even the opponents, even the most nationalist elements of Armenian politics who are, who are outspoken against this issue, do not oppose the policy, but oppose the process. In other words, the real test from the Armenian side is at what price, especially in terms of the legacy of genocide. And the most uh, hardcore opposition to the protocols, let's say, is much more nuanced and much more sophisticated and is not a, as black and white. But the interesting thing, too, is if the effort now is about civil society, track two diplomacy, et cetera, it also reveals that not enough was done by either the Armenian or Turkish sides to prepare their society for a possible normalization. Not enough was done to engage civil society as stakeholders in the early stage. But it also reveals that the whole process is only about normalization, not reconciliation. Reconciliation is much harder, will take much longer, and that's where the genocide issue will really come in. Normalization, where we're talking about opening borders and establishing diplomatic relations, from my point of view, that's the basic minimum of a normal civilized country. And as positive as I am behind the process, Turkey should not be rewarded or even praised for doing the basic minimum step of opening a border and establishing diplomatic relations with a neighbor. It's the first step toward reconciliation. Normalization, which we're engaged in, also recognizes the fact that current status quo is not normal and the burden is on Turkey. At the same time, in terms of what next, we do see that in many ways the Turkish demand for linking Nagorno-Karabakh, for requiring progress over Nagorno-Karabakh, to be fair, I think many in Turkey have to make that demand, mainly for Azerbaijani audiences. But I do not think that Turkish officials sincerely expect Armenia to give in to these demands. And in many ways, the real test is what constitutes progress over Nagorno-Karabakh in order to justify Turkey to move forward. Thank you attention to the fact that we are not behind our schedule, so far so good. And I'm very pleased, very pleased to, to present the second phase or the second round of our debate, and this time it is on human rights and civil society. So having listened to our, um, our speakers who uh, provided very important insights into what's happening in the region in terms of geopolitical, uh, geopolitical processes and uh, Armenian and Azeri, Armenian and Turkish relations. So now we'll have uh, a wonderful possibility to discuss the human rights situation and civil society, civil society problems in Armenia, and um, I would like to, I would like to 
present and describe very briefly our speakers, um, Ms. Amalia Kostanian, uh, uh, Ms. Larissa Minasian, and Mr. Boris Navardasian. They will share their insights with us. And the first speaker will be uh, Ms. Amalia Kostanian, uh, Transparency International Armenia, a chairwoman of this organization. And the general topic is human rights breaches, civil society and government cooperation, media issues and political corruption. So, Ms. Amalia Kostanian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I want to welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, on this event. And I want to um, express our gratitude to those who are patient enough to stay for the second panel. And uh, I don't know if it's typical for people located in Brussels to be more interested in regional conflicts than in human rights issues. But still, uh, I think that these two are very, very much interrelated issues. And as uh, previous speakers, one of previous speakers mentioned, and I appreciate that very much, that uh, there is no confidence building. Well, he didn't uh, say exactly what I am saying now, but uh, uh, confidence building um, between neighboring countries or between the countries or between the country and the European Union is impossible in my probably biased opinion if the country still has a lot of internal problems and still has a problem uh, in having uh, trust from uh, people of the country. So I do believe that uh, it's not very smart and politically correct even to separate these two issues because uh, it's a vicious circle, and unfortunately, uh, I don't believe that uh, the authoritarian regime or undemocratic developments in any countries, not just in Armenia, can ensure stability and energy security in the region, uh, the issues in, in which European institutions and uh, many powers are much more interested than in, in, in other issues like human rights. Uh, you can guess that because I'm representing Transparency International, I uh, will talk about bad things, about corruption. And before start, I, I start talking about negative things, I, I want to make a statement and uh, relate my statement with the title of our event. Uh, yes, Armenia is on the boundary of two worlds. And uh, maybe some people think that it's bad. I think that it's a very privileged position. And I'm not talking about geographical location. I'm talking about a unique possibility for Armenians to borrow, uh, unfortunately, not only positive things from neighbors, but to incorporate many traditions, values, and uh, elements of culture, cuisine, music, dance, uh, uh, and, and so on in our own culture and enriched our culture. So I think that we, we have to be very like grateful to the God, probably, uh, for uh, being at the intersection of civilizations, and though we're a landlocked country, but I think that it's not very important if there is real wish uh, within the society, within the state, to open itself to the world. So I want to see something positive in our location on the boundary of two words, and I hope very much that it's not a matter of making a choice. It's a matter of uh, finding uh, your place uh, in, in the world and your place between these two words or uh, I, I wouldn't say in one of those words because it's a kind of confrontation. I would love to see Armenia benefiting from the entire world in, in, in all possible means and, and meanings. Uh, so this is uh, my positive uh, introduction. And then I will um, tell you something about political corruption. Political corruption can be defined both with reference to the main actors involved, high level officials, normally political decision makers, who have the power to formulate policies, laws, and regulations, like president of the country, prime minister, ministers, or MPs, etc. And the purpose for which those corrupt officials 
are involved actually in political corruption, which is to sustain the hold on power or to keep power. Political corruption, uh, which can be uh, characterized as abuse of political power for personal or group and group gain, uh, has actually these two manifestations. First, it's accumulation of wealth through illegal means, and the second, it's use of extracted resources plus public funds for preservation of power. So when you uh, listen to, to this picture, uh, what do you think? I'm sure, I bet that if you have a representative from many other countries, not necessarily from our region, and not necessarily from developing and transitional countries, if I ask, uh, does it seem familiar to you? Many people would say, yes, that's about us. It's about us that money and other material uh, favors play a key role in the electoral processes, to buy loyalty very often through not only illegal, but brutal means, through intimidation, threat, moral pressure, buying members of commissions or uh, buying, bribing votes, abusing administrative and media resources for political campaigns, restricting freedoms and rights of opponents or competitors. And these are only some examples of political corruption. So it's, very understandable that there is, well, unfortunately, there is corruption and there is political corruption not only in the countries like Armenia. We, have, we, we can hear about political scandals happening in the US, in, in, in the developed European countries, or in Africa or Asia, like almost every day from news. So, unfortunately, that's something typical uh, probably for, for all human beings involved in politics and trying to keep power. But why it's so critical, in my opinion, for countries like Armenia? And uh, here I would say that after dreaming for, for hundreds of years about having the independent state, very pathetic probably statement, but I feel that we are responsible before our past and before our future, not even talking about our present, to make a, a really good country where everyone can feel secure, protected, and everyone can be proud of being citizen of that country. Well, unfortunately, uh, for Armenia or for countries like Armenia, political corruption uh, has very many negative consequences like institutional decay, arbitrary power, authoritarian tendencies, and reduced liberty. And political corruption poses a very serious problem for the development of Armenia by undermining democracy and good governance, reducing accountability and distorting representation, compromising the rule of law and moral values of society, eroding the market and the entire economy, making inefficient social services, and making a devastating effect on our limited natural resources. Uh, and what is the most crucial, uh, to my opinion, is that being involved in political corruption, be that in a form of falsified elections for years, for many years, or having oligarchic economy, our politicians undermine their own legitimacy. And they erodes, actually, ruins the credibility of the state itself. And here, it's very difficult to get people persuaded and uh, get people trusted to any government actions, even if they are stated to be aimed at promoting democracy or fighting corruption. What's going on in Armenia now uh, in, in combating corruption? I, I, I want to be fair uh, to say that, uh, yes, some people are, are being arrested in Armenia, unfortunately mainly for bribery, unfortunately from very low governance level, and unfortunately, uh, the, the, the idea of addressing only administrative corruption is not very 
even popular because uh, average citizens understand that in a highly hierarchical uh, governance system in Armenia with the uh, oligarchs and clanship relationship with interrelated uh, political and uh, economic interest, it's hard to believe that those people who are punished now or being punished now uh, are really uh, the most guilty ones. So political corruption calls for solutions of political nature. And it's not necessarily that I'm calling for coup d'etat, not at all. I am calling for radical political changes in the governance system in Armenia, and this requires a lot of sacrifice from the ruling elite. Otherwise, I think that the country will move towards a very, very undemocratic regime, while well, we are actually facing uh, uh, such developments, and uh, we will lose trust and confidence not only of our own people, people of Armenia, but I am afraid that what is very, very dangerous here is that because of being weak, because of giving a chance to make a pressure uh, from outside, uh, the, the government, the authorities of Armenia uh, put themselves in a not very favorable position to resist external pressure when the state or the authorities are forced actually to, to make compromises, for example, on Karabakh or on Turkish Armenian issues uh, at expense of, of the country's interest. And this is, I think, something that really makes our authorities very weak. And here, I cannot uh, stay away uh, from criticizing uh, the, the role or position of external actors as well. Well, I, to say that I'm very much disappointed of inconsistency of European institutions and not only European actors, US government and, and other interested actors. Well, actually, Russia is very consistent because uh, Russia never very much claim, you know, to be democratic or to promote democracy. So I have no problems with Russia uh, from this uh, view. So what's going on? Uh, we are witnessing uh, this, you know, ups and downs in, 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 in not, not even interest, but in, in, in position, or it's not ups and downs, it's pros and contras, or it's positive or negative, or whatever you call it. Uh, sometimes we, we, really, we are really confused, or not even confused, but we are really very unhappy about how much the external actors can close their eyes, for example, on falsified elections by having European and other international observers uh, stating that everything has been done in accordance to uh, international standards. And when it's needed, when the, the momentum is just different, they can use the pressure and manipulate with the, the facts that, you know, elections are falsified in your country. And, you know, if you make a compromise, well, it wouldn't be uh, the first priority in our agenda for criticism. So I don't know how much time uh, I have. It's OK. Uh, I can talk about corruption probably for ages. So I, I, I would prefer to give you time to ask questions if there are any questions, because I have to run to the airport, uh, because tomorrow I'm having another presentation on a very similar issue, South Caucasus and EU, and the role of civil society and things like that, and cooperation with the government. So I would be happy to answer your questions, and sorry for being a, a little bit general on this issue, because I don't think that we need to go for details. We need now to really help ourselves, first of all, understand that we Armenians really need radical changes. We really need to improve the situation ourselves to make us stronger in the play in the international arena. Because I will repeat myself, I don't trust in any conflict resolution when you have really serious conflicts 
in your, inside your country. And I think that many decisions uh, seemingly unpopular uh, for the public, not only in Armenia, but in neighboring countries, can be presented to the public much easier if the trust and the confidence in the state, in, in, in the government officials, uh, is improved. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Amalia Kostanian. So what, your words reminded me of a very interesting debate we had in Lithuania some time ago, and the debate was whether uh, it is possible to have a successful foreign policy if you have a total mess inside the country. So if domestic policy is going down in many ways and it's a failure, how is it possible to have a successful foreign policy? So I think methodologically, so you formulated a very, very, uh, very important point, which could be debated, uh, I think, in a seminar, in a conference, debated to this issue. In any case, since, um, since Amalia is in rush, so I just would like to urge to ask a question. If you would like to, some comments or questions, please, yes. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, since it was very general, and that's what it called for, let me ask a specific question. Armenia, being one of the few countries with a very uh, significant diaspora, what role do you see in terms of diaspora, in terms of anti-corruption? I do believe that diaspora could become uh, very, very important, not only in like fighting corruption. No, I don't expect you, for example, to come and, and fight corruption in Transparency International. But I do believe that people who live in countries with a more institutionalized traditions of transparency and accountability and representation can bring some ideas or can play a role model for Armenians, I, Armenians, uh, sorry for, uh, for separating this uh, two. Uh, and they can come and show how you can do business, uh, not necessarily through illegal ways. Though I know that many diaspora people came and tried, and most of them failed. And those who stayed, unfortunately, adjusted themselves to corrupt pattern of behavior in Armenia. I do believe that diaspora, I, I, I appreciate very much the financial help of diaspora and sometimes moral help of diaspora, but I'm very much disappointed that in the diaspora's agenda, democracy or good governance, not even visible. And I do uh, understand the value of national, not nationalistic probably, ideas. And I do believe that genocide has to be recognized and all the conflicts have to be resolved because it's in our interest. But I don't believe that you can close your eyes on those things. And I'm sorry to say so in a, in a such, well, no offense, uh, to pretend that everything is going on well. And, and that's a big problem and I would call uh, our, diaspora Armenians to be more sensitive to democracy and human rights violations in Armenia. Yes, we have two questions. Uh, yeah, yes, you and then you. Yeah, yes, please go ahead. Uh, my name is Irina Vinyan. First of all, I want to thank you <coughs> for this very objective insight. Um, as you mentioned, I, I completely agree with you on the points that you expressed. Um, you mentioned that uh, corruption is hardly being combated in Armenia on the government level and the civil society is very weak. And on the other hand, you expressed your disappointment with the West, which claims to promote democracy. So the situation is very desperate. It is, in fact, desperate. Um, what are the possible solutions to this situation? What are the solutions that you suggest? Is there a way out of it? There is always a way out. But if I give you now a, a, a recipe, I would probably uh, be eligible for a Nobel Prize 
if there is no Nobel Prize for corruption, but still, or I will become a national hero probably. Uh, I have to confess, I don't have a solution right now, but I do believe that we can learn from other countries. And when I uh, say that it's not necessarily to, to change the governance style through coup d'etat, I'm serious saying so, because there is an example of Hong Kong with a very corrupt uh, government, uh, which realized the danger of corruption for their own power, and they changed the situation through coercion, very, very brutal actually means, like by detection, by prevention, and by education, like by educating people. Because I don't, you know, if you know that corruption is very beneficial, uh, you wouldn't trust any official statement to say that you shouldn't take or give bribe. Uh, and I, I do believe in common sense. I, I want to believe that uh, even without a revolution, one day, and we have to help uh, this day, you know, to come through, uh, even those corrupt people or those who are not so corrupt, they actually will use their common sense to understand that it's a danger for Armenia. It's a danger for their kids. It's a danger for their wealth. If, of course, they are not going to run for Russia or Switzerland, I, I, I don't know about their plans. But I, I, I want to believe in common sense. But uh, if we just sit and wait until someone comes and helps, I don't believe in that because you see, there is very low interest in what's going in Armenia in the world, and it's our problem. And we need to, to, to start forcing, pushing. Unfortunately, we don't have real means to do that. Civil society in Armenia, well, I myself, I wouldn't talk about on behalf of the whole civil society because it's also very diversified. I don't have access to media. I don't have access to TV, for example, uh, we, and uh, the pluralism and this, the, being, having alternative opinion is not so much tolerated and respected in, in Armenia. But I believe if, if we really push things forward, not necessarily calling them anti-corruption, but freedom of media, uh, civil rights and political freedoms, uh, free market and things like that, I'm sure that we will see some progress. But the point is that, yes, um, unfortunately, I don't see real political will to, to, to do that. But I do believe that common sense or external conditions or the situation uh, may change, may change the mentality or position. If not, I am afraid the current authorities should just, you know, leave. Absolutely. Because it's, there is no, how to say, there is no logic in what's going on in Armenia. And, uh, and I, I think that they, they need to understand that for the sake of Armenia. Thank you. Mr. Tanev. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And first of all, let me jo uh, join my voice to those who have congratulated you on your initiative. It's an excellent one, and I'm sorry I couldn't be here for more of the day. I'm a very close friend of Armenia, and uh, as a member of the Parliament on the Foreign Affairs Committee, I, I'm uh, uh, a spokesman uh, for my group uh, coordinator, and I do my best to, to defend Armenia. Just a couple of questions, specific questions, uh, to that excellent presentation uh, <clears throat> by um, Amalia. Um, first of all, where does, where does Armenia rank? I mean, one of, the, one of the kind of ways of putting pressure on governments is to name and shame them. Uh, can you give me a figure? Because that's often cited for countries. And where does Armenia rate regarding its neighbors and, 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 and comparable countries? And you mentioned learning from other countries. Uh, the Georgians make a lot of fuss about how clean they are now, how much they have defeated corruption, that Saakashvili's government in particular. Is there something to be learned from neighboring Georgia? Is it a role model in the South Caucasus? Uh, one of the things that they did, of course, was to pay higher salaries uh, to the police, to the judiciary, and so on. Is that part of the problem that the salaries are too low in the public services? Therefore, people, the temptations are too high if they want to keep uh, a family or a home or whatever that they need to resort to, 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 to corrupt practices. 
because, as you pointed out, corruption, in my view, uh, is wrong in itself, but it also distorts economic decisions and tends to hold countries back. And the other thing, which is another sort of specific question, I mean, MEPs in this parliament, members of my national parliament in the United Kingdom, we have a very strict regime, as do the ministers, to declare in a public register, which is online, all our financial interests, you know, basically. So any journalist can go and see, you know, what I own, what I do, what my earnings are, and so on. Does something comparable exist in Armenia? Is it enforced? Is it, and, and is it scrutinized by the media? Thank you for your questions. I would start with the uh, ranking. Unfortunately, Armenia has been in a stagnation, I call it that way, in a group of countries with a rampant corruption below three uh, in, in Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, and it's not only about Transparency International Indexes, it's uh, according to the World Bank Institute and many other uh, recognized uh, international institutions' rankings. Uh, and what was really uh, a shame, actually, for I think for our authorities, that last year Armenia went down while our neighboring countries went up. Turkey and Georgia are progressing very actively, and Azerbaijan last year, though it's still uh, placed lower than Armenia, it also showed some progress. And you know that this is very like a, our uh, dilemma always when we are, we have been always competing, but when we had no conflict, it was more in a friendly manner. But now, when you have a press conference about any ranking on corruption, the first question journalists ask, and I'm sure that probably it's the same in our neighboring countries, and what's going on in the neighboring countries. So unfortunately, Armenia, and I'm sure that it's because uh, of tragic events, because of falsified elections, because of restricted freedoms, because TI index is a combination of indices. So it, it, it uses, it, 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 it doesn't uh, use its own uh, references or ranks. It, it, it just combines World Bank, Freedom House, uh, Global Economic Forum, and, and, and things like that. So yes, uh, it's getting worse now. Uh, as to Georgia, in spite of uh, real success uh, of Georgia of combating administrative corruption, I dare uh, to say that there is a huge political corruption in that country. So maybe we, we can learn how to tackle corruption in customs and traffic police. And this is not only about salaries, because in Armenia, for your information, the judges have much higher salary than the president and the prime minister, I mean official salary, because we have increased uh, like substantially the, the, the salary of judges. Uh, but this is not about salaries, because this is necessary but not sufficient. Because if you increase the salary up to, I don't know, million, uh, say, euros or drums, Armenian currency, but the judge still works in a corrupt system with a nepotism, not necessarily bribing, being dependent on the executive or being dependent on relatives, neighbors, you know, friends and things like that. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that they will became, be, become very clear. As to declaration, very good question. And actually, there is an initiative um, from authorities now in Armenia to first time to address the conflict of interest situation. We have the legislation requiring the declaration, annual declaration of income and assets uh, for physical persons and including high level officials. Uh, the tax authorities is responsible for verifying, but so far only some officials have been administratively punished by paying fines for not submitting the declaration, but no one was detected or punished for submitting wrong information. So there is no investigation, real investigation on what's going on. And uh, every child in Armenia knows who has uh, the, the luxury car or, you know, who uh, has a like, you know, a castle to live in. So we are a very small society. So everyone knows that it's a huge conflict of interest in the parliament when 
businessmen, though restricted by the Constitution to, to run the business, they are proudly announcing that they are running the businesses. So conflict of interest is everywhere, in NGOs, in media, in government sector, in businesses. So that's absolutely un undressed and regulated. But uh, there is an initiative, and uh, I, I, I cannot make any official statement, but because we are somehow involved in, in, in this issue, uh, that, that the government is going to uh, promote the law on uh, public service with some elements uh, of uh, controlling conflict of interest and even form a new body to uh, see how it's going on with the high-level officials, like high-level ethics commission. But it's still not adopted, so I hope this will be promoted. But on the other hand, we have a societal problem here. Uh, because if in the society the law is not respected, the code of ethics wouldn't be respected, I'm afraid. So we need to have uh, real, real enforcement of not only the laws, but some you know, moral standards and things like that. And corruption should be a shame in public opinion, not a privilege like now. Okay, thank you very much. I know that you are on the run. Uh, Amalia, thank you so much. So, um, thank you very much, uh, and I hope that this is the first, but not the last event you are organizing uh, in the European Parliament, and I hope to see more interest, more assistance, uh, and more consistency in, in, in the European institutions towards Armenia and region. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much of <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, it's a promise. There will be many, many more things. And, uh, and now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Uh, Larissa Minasian, who is PhD and Director of, Open, of the Open Society Institute, Armenia. Yes. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mr. Donskis, and thank you again. I want to join my, uh, join my uh, colleagues who spoke uh, before uh, myself and, uh, and uh, express our appreciation by, uh, for organizing this event and for you coming and uh, uh, expressing interest towards uh, so much important uh, issues as human rights and democracy in Armenia. And I'm privileged to have uh, an opportunity to bring um, civil society opinion uh, on these views. Um, I uh, would also like to uh, uh, reflect to the questions that were asked, but uh, probably in the end of my um, uh, brief presentation, because I think the, those were very good questions and very relevant uh, to the topic. Um, there is this notion of Armenia, uh, which I uh, hear and come uh, across time and again, and who, which is, uh, which was also presented today uh, by Mr. Donskis to us. This small nation uh, with long uh, history, Christian tradition, and thus, uh, and, and with diaspora uh, well established and uh, spread all over the world, and. Uh, Thus, um, kind of open to Europe, to European, and, uh, European values, and to integration. Um, long um, history of unprecedented growth, economic growth, and reported institutional reform in Armenia also come to support that notion. Um, True, uh, yes, probably. However, what I will be presenting um, is not supporting uh, the notion. It's, um, it's not rejecting the notion, I hope. Uh, the point is to, 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 to give some ideas how this notion can be turned into uh, not only a notion, but a real working plan, a strategy for a country to become part of, uh, uh, part of democratic open society. Um, um, presidential elections, um, which uh, were mentioned uh, a number of times, of 2008, um, followed by violent suppression of demonstrations, um, death of 10 people, uh, appearance of political prisoners for the first time uh, in many years, um, changing of legislation in, towards uh, more autocratic regime, um, 
suppression of freedoms. Um, indeed, uh, indeed uh, played a very cru critical role in the recent history of Armenia. Uh, the events are well documented. Uh, the rampant violation of human rights and suppression of freedoms that followed is also uh, quite uh, well reported. Um, unfortunately, uh, where I come not to agree with my colleague uh, who spoke earlier, uh, Richard Kirakosan, that the problem started there and continues. Um, uh, to us, the problem started much earlier. For at least, um, um, and, 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 and just think about that. How come that a country that was always presented as a good kid on a block, uh, performing much better than some other neighboring country, oh yeah, that um, it's not perfect, but in comparison, it is better. It's not uh, uh, good, but you know what, democracy is a long process. Yeah, that all is true. However, for us living in that country, working in human rights, uh, uh, honoring of uh, fundamental freedoms, uh, developing democratic institutions, it was uh, quite clear for years that things were not going uh, in the right direction. Um, and uh, what, um, what, uh, what, uh, what was clear that uh, you don't need to compare Armenia to some other country, and we started from actually Baltics, uh, uh, comparing to, okay, that's not as good as there, but, uh, and go now to uh, somewhere um, uh, closer to Turkmenistan, you need to compare Armenia to Armenia previous year. Are we progressing? Are we making any uh, uh, reasonable progress? And are we going into the right direction? And this is what we working in the country in these particular areas uh, haven't been noticing for much longer than, uh, than the crisis uh, that followed the presidential elections. Um, the control of executive, control over uh, businesses with uh, rampant growth of oligarchic powers, control over, then followed by control over the political parties, and then consolidating control over the broadcast media. Um, that all has been happening in a country that was pretty okay performing, uh, reportedly performing on uh, democratic reform and uh, institution building. Um, and uh, simply the, the crisis of March 1st and uh, what uh, Amalia was describing, uh, rampant political um, corruption uh, were only very visible on the ground. Um, after consolidating the power in, uh, in, in, in um, the um, in the area of business, political parties, uh, media, we now are uh, getting closer to uh, controlling public space, debate, participation. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to say is that institutionally and systemically uh, there were problems with uh, democracy in the country. And I will only stop on uh, those which I uh, believe do matter for what has been said and probably what will be said. Independent judiciary. Uh, the report that, uh, that published um, uh, by the ODIR and um, reported on the trials of uh, political prisoners following March 1st um, uh, really reveal huge uh, problems with uh, the judiciary and fair trial in Armenia. However, uh, preceding that, there were numerous court monitorings, uh, numerous instances where uh, sh uh, which showed that judiciary in Armenia is extremely dependent, is extremely controlled, uh, and fair trial is something that is violated, uh, not only in politically sensitive cases, not only in business um, elite sensitive cases, but quite often and quite uh, quite rampantly. And uh, corruption here is uh, is is also. Um, I'll refer to that later because that was the question uh, on on salaries um, that that has relevance. Um, and this this. Dependence of judiciary, its uh, its uh, and control uh, of judiciary um, is not only at the level of implementation, but despite this 
huge and very successful, reportedly successful judicial reform of uh, within the European neighborhood policy, within the World Bank uh, loan, is uh, planted into, in, inherently, intrinsically planted into the legislation uh, and uh, the practices uh, that are legal in, in the country. Uh, this is the appointment, the uh, censuring, the uh, punishment and disrobing of uh, judges that make them extremely dependent, still dependent on the executive. Um, dependence of judiciary, prosecutorial control over judiciary that continues from the Soviet times and is basically uh, almost uh, planted in the legislation as well, um, allows for, uh, allows for uh, human rights violations in pre-trial and in, at investigative level. Use of uh, torture in police precincts in pretrial is common. Uh, use of torture to solicit uh, self-incriminating uh, testimony um, is common. Uh, police brutality, unfortunately, has uh, resulted in two deaths in uh, police uh, precincts, uh, one of which happened only last month, and uh, one before happened in May 2007. No one is, uh, is, is persecuted and uh, convicted for that, uh, for that uh, death. Uh, a witness appeared in the police uh, precinct and being a witness somehow decided to commit suicide and threw himself from the second floor uh, in 2007. And a witness or, 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 or um, allegedly um, uh, the perpetrator uh, again in April decided to commit suicide by um, knifing himself. Um, Pre-trial facilities remain to uh, remain closed uh, for uh, for uh, observation and monitoring, or rather, only the facility is open. However, the brutality is happening uh, in the investigation wards. Um, human rights violations in closed institutions remain a problem uh, in foster care. Only very recently, uh, child abuse has uh, become part of uh, the the. The, the whole um, uh, set of uh, common violations. And, uh, and, uh, and here, uh, this can be uh, continued for quite a, a long series. It's not um, intimidation of the activists who report on the violations is also part of a problem. Impunity of the perpetrators is part of uh, a very uh, institutionalized problem. It's uh, how the crisis that was in 2008, uh, not the crisis, um, it's how the crisis was uh, handled is very problematic in the country. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, enormous deterioration that it did um, is not being addressed heads on. It's not being addressed through a uh, democratic and um, meaningful way, but is mostly being suppressed and tried to be controlled and make go away um, as, uh, as is. And this is what uh, really uh, makes it very difficult to have any um, hope for real democratization uh, that is promised and is still uh, part of uh, the announced politics. To give you an example, examples and not to sound like uh, only, um, uh, only stating uh, um, things without giving, uh, without supporting it factually, recent developments after the elections in two, uh, two years after the elections, um, really go uh, towards not uh, reconciliation of very divided Armenian public, towards not uh, liberalization and democratization, towards not uh, fighting uh, the uh, abuse and administrative abuse and corruption, but towards more of a control and towards more of a suppression. Um, the um, examples. Um, 
elections are, were so problematic, elections are of so paramount importance, and the first uh, big elections after the presidential elections, the city uh, mayoral uh, elections for city of Yerevan, were notoriously uh, bad, uh, conducted with huge violations um, and, uh, and breaches. Um, legislation changes, legislative changes in uh, uh, almost all areas uh, that followed since uh, the elections also went toward, not towards uh, the, uh, the, the democratization or liberalization, but against uh, the changes in suggested changes in the legislation on religious organizations uh, show less uh, tolerance towards uh, the freedom, uh, less, uh, less honoring of the freedom, and more control. Uh, changes suggested to, in um, NGO legislation uh, uh, do uh, come as restrictive of the uh, fundamental freedom of association and more control and intervention into civil society affairs. Uh, suggested uh, s uh, changes and suggested changes uh, again into broadcast legislation, uh, of which I assume Boris will be giving more professional uh, update, uh, in, look into consolidating and controlling broadcast media uh, through the process of uh, digitalization and afterwards. Um, unfortunately, these uh, old developments uh, not only uh, are uh, well documented and are happening, they also had already uh, very negative consequences. Um, 67 uh, million remainder of the Millennium Challenge account, which is a large uh, US uh, program to uh, grant the countries for economic uh, development, which are performing democratically and through good governance. Uh, uh, that money was cut simply because the, uh, the standards of good governance, the standards of uh, ruling justly uh, were breached by the recent developments. In the time of economic crisis, uh, this came very hard on Armenian population, but even that didn't prompt uh, real improvement in the uh, areas which were so problematic in the first place. Um, um, in what is remaining, in the, in the absence of competitive political process, as we heard, in the absence of uh, independent media and free speech, as we will hear, um, the role of uh, civil society uh, as defender and as protector of public interest um, is really critical and becoming uh, ever more important. Uh, and there are organizations in the country that uh, for years do the work professionally and uh, methodically um, go with um, protection of human rights, go with uh, uh, monitoring and uh, critique and policy development uh, towards better uh, practices and uh, policies in implementation and, uh, and uh, securing fundamental freedoms. However, it would be naive to think that all the negative developments do not reflect uh, on these organizations, that intimidation and absence, uh, absence of access to justice won't reflect negatively on the civil society development. Of course, uh, it has. And when the crisis struck and massive human rights violations were part of the reality, only very few uh, human rights organizations literally a handful of human rights organizations were capable, willing, and able to stand up and protect the human rights. Uh, where are the other 4,200? 4,200 were at that time registered civil society organizations. Of course, not all of them are human rights. However, it's really a staggering comparison. Only a handful are there to uh, protect rights and freedoms. Uh, and uh, uh, the advocate for, for the reform. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's not only through intimidation, it's not only through uh, bad legislation that uh, the control of the civil uh, society, the control of the public space and debate is happening in the country. It's uh, through uh, quite successful co-optation, and again, uh, that was happening for 
Thank you. For quite some time in the country, uh, that uh, the um, regime uh, is trying to control and to interfere into uh, that uh, space. Um, supporting a large number of governmental, non-governmental organizations, so-called gongos, supporting uh, uh, loyal organizations. It breeds a large cadre of um, endorsers and rubber stampers of, uh, of uh, uh, and, and those who mimic her and uh, manipulate public participation, public policy development. Um, and, and, uh, and processes that are so important for democratic governance and democratic open society. Um, so what's, uh, what's the hope? What do we do? And uh, where uh, do we go from uh, here? Um, indeed, uh, the, uh, indeed, there was uh, mentioned again by Richard about Europe's uh, fulfilling its potential. And that's uh, a lot about that. Um, there was and there is European neighborhood policy. There is, there will be. Um, uh, Eastern and it's uh, it's about uh, that leverage that there is uh, that I want to uh, pledge here that European Union institutions of Europe uh, not only of European Union but also Council of Europe have really a mission to fulfill here to not only assist Armenia through expertise through uh, so needed funding but also uh, to provide benchmarking, to provide conditionality for real improvement. Because as Amalia urged here, it's paramount importance of uh, really changing the course, really uh, setting backward uh, motion into uh, democratization, into uh, uh, respect towards human rights, into uh, participatory democracy, uh, and uh, into uh, institution building such as independent media, um, independent and professional judiciary, and good governance. Um, so uh, I want uh, to bring uh, uh, this notion of the leverage that Europe has, uh, the, the policies that er there are, to follow uh, with uh, negotiating this uh, association agreement. It's a huge leverage for a country which uh, pronounced its European uh, vocation and the policy of uh, integration uh, is uh, so high on the agenda of uh, the country's government. Um, so that's uh, basically my message and I want to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Larissa Minasian. And I suppose that maybe we should uh, give the floor uh, to our last speaker, uh, to uh, Mr. Boris Novosardian. And then I think we'll take, we'll take questions and comments, just to save some time, OK? So if I may suggest this uh, for the remainder of our time here. So I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Boris Novosardian, president of the Yerevan Media Club. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, the organizers, and all uh, those of you who have patience to remain, to still be here. And uh, as, uh, as I understand, I am the last obstacle between uh, you and the reception. Uh, I, I promise to be as brief as possible. So I, I will speak specifically uh, on the situation <clears throat> in media. In Armenia, and I will start with a brief uh, presentation of what is media landscape in Armenia. It is uh, quite a um, common uh, situation for the post-Soviet countries. In many countries, we have similar situation. I mean, the formula is the same. Uh, the print media is more or less diverse, and online media also. However, print media reflects uh, very much the partisan approaches to, to the uh, events and uh, covers the, the situation in the country uh, coming from a narrow uh, political uh, interest of this or that party, though very diverse political interests. 
uh, online media is more oriented towards general uh, public interest and uh, <clears throat> is uh, more independent from that point of view and uh, does not just uh, represent uh, the political views on the issues, but tries to inform people, to, to, to make them um, more aware about uh, internal and external political life. Uh, we could say uh, probably that print and online media are, if not independent, then at least free in Armenia, if not one obstacle. Uh, these are the uh, events following the tragic uh, developments of March uh, 1 and 2 of 2008, which was uh, mentioned many times today, uh, when, uh, in fact, uh, illegal preemptive censorship was exercised towards the print media, uh, which resulted in uh, a stop of publishing of uh, some independent and opposition newspapers for uh, two weeks and also blocking of independent websites. And since there was no official accusation of such measures, and no um, uh, statements from, from the government that this was done illegally, this allows us to predict that uh, in another tense political situation, the same measures could be implemented. And this, of course, does not guarantee uh, freedom of uh, even print and online media. Uh, it is commonly uh, accepted that broadcast media in the country is mostly controlled by the pro-government circles and uh, covers uh, all political news um, in the very strict frames of uh, narrow political interests. So uh, we can say that even some very important events uh, in the country and abroad are just uh, not uh, covered anyhow, because this, uh, this, contra this could contradict or uh, could um, create the problems for the pro-government political forces. Maybe the only exclusion uh, was the topic which we discussed today, Armenian-Turkish relations when uh, the diversity of views of uh, diversity of views even among uh, pro government political forces uh, brought to the situation when even broadcast media were uh, re reporting on the issues from different perspectives but uh, in most of the issues we do not see such uh, such diversity uh, of coverage and the symbol of um, problems with the broadcast media in Armenia is A1 Plus TV company, which was, which lost uh, its license in 2002. Maybe many people here in the audience know this story because it's already a history of Armenian media. And uh, then uh, A1 Plus participated in 12 tenders for frequencies and uh, did not achieve any results. It is still um, deprived of um, of air. Uh, arguments of the government on that issue was that there are no free frequencies, vacant frequencies, uh, to, to be provided to A1 Plus through, through attenders, and they were, they were proposing and promising that with uh, digital switch over there will be better technical uh, possibilities, and then A1 Plus could uh, try again. Uh, and now we uh, have uh, this process of digitalization more or less uh, framed and uh, uh, represented in the concept in, in the draft law. And according to uh, this new draft law on television and radio, we see that the number of frequencies that will be provided for broadcasting uh, are declining. So, <clears throat> in fact, this means that no new alternative TV company has real chance to appear in the broadcast media ma market. And the same refers, of course, to uh, A1 Plus TV company. Uh, this is uh, not the only uh, missing or shortcoming of the draft law. 
this uh, the, uh, decreasing the number of, <clears throat> of frequencies. There are many other problems there, which are pointed by both uh, local civil society, media community, and international experts. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, uh, by situation uh, for today, uh, none of their uh, suggestions and criticism were accepted by the authors of the law, and most probably it will be uh, draft law, and most probably it will be um, approved <laughs> by the parliament as it is. Uh, despite the fact that the parliament itself and the head of the parliament criticized strongly the draft when it was submitted for the uh, first hearing. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I try to analyze the situation in Armenian media not only from the perspective what is the competition between pro-government and opposition or independent media, but even uh, taking into account the uh, future of the media uh, as such in, in the global context. And I see here another problem, whether in this situation traditional professional media is able to uh, compete with uh, new challenges in the face of booming internet and user-generated uh, generated, uh, content. And I see that in such situation when uh, the media is not able, in fact, to satisfy information demands of the society, it will be removed uh, from the market. And, uh, <clears throat> and with all its problems, the non-professional uh, media will, uh, will uh, be a winner in, uh, in the competition in Armenia. Although I know there are a lot of efforts in, uh, in the world and European countries to, to face this problem and try to support and try to develop professional media, but even there the successes are not that good. I know that, for instance, in Germany, uh, the average, uh, um, the average uh, age of uh, people watching, for instance, public television is 55. Uh, in Armenia, the situation is even worse because it's not interesting. And so uh, this, this was the bad story. And the good story is that um, in the view of this uh, booming internet, uh, we see that uh, technological process is happening, progress is happening in Armenia as well. And we have uh, a lot of people who try to use this opportunity of technological progress to inform the society. And uh, luckily, uh, we, and for, fortunately, we do not have uh, such a strong restriction of, of the freedom of internet as it is, for instance, in Azerbaijan, where bloggers, as you know, are arrested, and where uh, the talks about uh, licensing the internet broadcasting are becoming very serious. Uh, in Armenia, there were also some statements that uh, the bro uh, internet broadcasting, sh broadcasting should be uh, licensed, but uh, I do not think that these efforts will uh, bring any practical results. So um, this is the main hope for, uh, for the media ensuring its role of informing uh, the society and creating a responsible and modern society in Armenia. Uh, the, only, the only problem here is that we are losing the time for that. And uh, what my, <clears throat> my colleagues said be, uh, remains the reality, not touched by, by traditional and professional media, not uh, involving this media in the improvement of the situation. So that's our concern. Um, and uh, uh, since uh, there are very strong efforts in Armenia to promote development of new technologies in the media, I think that anyway, uh, we will have some time open and informed society. Unfortunately, this is not in the, in the agenda of the government official policy, uh, which probably does not realize the challenges that the world and global society faces with, with uh, new developments. 
uh, but objective processes uh, will win at, at last, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, if, if you have some questions to both speakers or comments, please. So we have some time, I suppose. Yes. Would you be kind enough to switch the mic? Please turn on the mic. In Europe, liberties and democracy put some uh, centuries to overcome all the difficulties and uh, uh, costed many, many struggles in every area. Um, I suppose that the times are, ch have, have changed. Times changed and there are mechanisms, uh, international mechanisms, European mechanisms, uh, in order to help new emerging countries uh, to get more democratic and more uh, free countries internally uh, 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 seen. Um, what do you think that, um, what, what are the roles of the civil society in Armenia and what is the role of the external forces, external uh, bodies, European and international bodies, uh, in order to overcome this situation in Armenia, uh, knowing that the, um, uh, in, our, um, in our idea, in our opinion, uh, Armenian society is not ready to struggle today uh, with its own forces. Uh, that's what we see from the, from, uh, the foreign countries. Armenian society is not, uh, is not uh, uh, taught to struggle against injustices, against uh, uh, breaches on liberties, and, and so on. And what, what do you think the role of the Armenian society in Armenia is today in order to overcome this situation? Um, a couple of things. Thank you for the question. Um, indeed, uh, none of us uh, is uh, idealist or maximalist or uh, extremist in the thinking that we shall wake up and live in democratic and beautiful country. We know democracy takes time. If we didn't know that, we have been uh, taught so by every other uh, person coming from Western Europe or America to talk to us. You people, you, you shall be patient. Democracy takes time. It's a step-by-step -step process. Indeed, it's a step-by-step -step process. And uh, you can uh, pass, sorry for being kind of uh, preaching, but uh, unless you go the right direction, you never are going to uh, reach there, however step-by-step -step or, or, or fast you go. So uh, the point is uh, that um, it's, it's the tendencies that we're concerned. It's the, uh, uh, it's the direction uh, that we're concerned. For years, and I said uh, that before, comparing Armenia to Armenia, we see regression rather than progress. So that's on your uh, first point, and I do take it. It's, it's, a, it's a long process, and we're ready to assist that. On Armenian society being ready to uh, fight for justice and fight for freedoms, um, I would certainly, I would certainly, with all due respect, not agree to your observation. Um, because uh, in uh, 1988, uh, the Armenian society, which was not, uh, which was taught how to obey for 70 years, uh, uh, was extremely capable, vocal, and active fighting for exactly that, for justice. It wasn't for some nationalistic uh, idea for um, uh, Armenia from sea to sea. It, it was exactly the justice that uh, unified uh, the people. In uh, 2007, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the opposition leader and for, for, for whatever agenda, uh, uh, Levanter Petrosian um, appeared, 
it was the it was um, the justice agenda that unified the country people, and that was it. I mean, they wouldn't say about. Uh, uh, rights as it is written in the declaration, but it's the security in one's country, it's the justice, it's the courts and lawlessness, it's the free speech that people went under the slogan. So I won't undermine uh, Armenia's uh, people's uh, capacity to really assume, understand, and fight for that. Um, uh, it, it, even even with massive suppression and brutality, it's not dead, and that's that's a big thing because the whole machine is turned onto that. Cooptation, intimidation are turned onto that. So um, uh, I'm saying this as someone living there, working there, and if you see it otherwise, I would certainly urge you to reassess it and try to support that uh, uh, that uh, that notion. Uh, what is the role of the civil society? To watchdog, to report on the violations, to urge uh, uh, involvement of all those who stand for the same values, and I would urge diaspora to be one of those who would support Armenian civil society for better free speech for better uh, judiciary, for better security in our own country, because um, because it's through those things that we uh, eventually are going to progress. And it's much better and easier work to lobby for a democratic country than for a non-democratic country. So, uh, so I think Armenian civil society has a very important role. It's our job to do. Uh, it's not uh, someone else's job to come and to uh, raise awareness, uh, to monitor the rights, to report on rights, uh, to, uh, uh, to watchdog uh, practices and implementation. Uh, and we would only be very uh, honored to have the support um, and the leverage that there is with uh, intergovernmental organizations and the huge diaspora that we have. That's my opinion. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Novosadino. I will just add to what Larissa said and bring just one example. Uh, it is from my sphere of uh, professional interest. It is about uh, Gala TV company, which was under very strong pressure of the government because uh, re uh, refused to be controlled before the elections. And it was uh, imposed a very um, high for a provincial TV company. They are based in uh, Gyumri, um, second city of Armenia, not in the capital. Um, uh, very high <clears throat> tax penalty, uh, about $85,000, which is huge amount for them. And in fact, the citizens of Armenia, Armenia collected $100,000 for that company and paid this penalty to keep the company in the air. I mean, this is the example which hardly could be found in any other country. When <clears throat> a private TV company is supported by the whole society, even uh, uh, people from those cities that do not watch Gala. So they were supporting the idea. They were supporting someone who is ready to resist pressure. And um, I think that such kind of trends which would be much uh, more frequent in Armenia if um, the external support to um, real uh, will for freedoms and development and modernization would be stronger than the external support for conservatism and for keeping the situation as it is. Unfortunately, we no, not always see that this support is indeed stronger for progressive forces than for the others. And this uh, comes both from international institutions and unfortunately from our compatriots living abroad. Uh, this is a problem which is founding its solution, I think, because the thinking is changing, the, assessing, the assessment of situation is changing, and if uh, the society in Armenia will feel that um, the external um, interest is there, 
that uh, external assessment of the situation coincides with the local assessment of the situation and not vice versa, then they will be probably more motivating, motivated for fighting for their rights. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, this will happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe some final point, question, or comment. If this is not the case, so then I have a great pleasure to thank both speakers from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for for this wonderful panel, and um, I would like to invite you uh, to the screening of the film, which I regard as one of the most wonderful and fantastic movies of the 20th century, Sayat Nova, by the great Armenian film director, Sergei Barajanov, 7 o'clock. Before that, we have some time for coffee. It will be a coffee break outside, and 7 o'clock we have the screening, and uh, the reception will follow the films. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>